Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm talking about sampling method. Okay, so when we're talking about sampling methods, we're talking about how we have an overarching population that we want to get samples of individuals from. I know I just used the word in the definition. We, we want to pull individual people out of the sample, assuming we're working with people. Okay, so the first thing you could do is literally observe everyone in the population, but if you have a large population, you can't do that. Although, if you if you have a population, let's say, uh, psychology undergraduate students at the College of Boston, you could literally just ask every one of them. Assuming you're in a position of power to where you can read all of them and they feel significantly obligated to respond. And I don't think that's a crazy assumption, you could do that. But let's say you, your population is much broader than that. Then you, you, you can't, if your population is all over the world and it's comprised of 3 million people or something like that, you have to sample. You you cannot act off three million people, and even if you wanted to, they wouldn't all respond. So you need to use one of these sampling methods. Simple random sampling. This is a great idea, and it's very hard to do. But basically, in simple ran random sampling, you need to have a essentially a list of every person in that population and randomly select them. And I and I mean with equal probability someone in your hometown is not yet equally as likely to be selected as someone across the world. That's very difficult. You need a, a comprehensive catalog and you need a very robust communication system and incentive system to get them to respond. If it's a smaller population, like a student at the College of Thompson, that's where I did my undergrad and that's why I keep coming up with College of Thompson example. Um, then you get email those students and randomly and then get get some for forcing them to respond and call that good enough. So the conclusion here is that simple random sampling is a great option. It is perhaps even the best option, but it's very difficult in practice. Okay, so we have more complex sampling and maybe the, the good example for this type of deal is uh, like a political polling. And I, I know uh, the politics in the U.S. doesn't necessarily translate to other places. Um, so maybe I'll get like a, a political point. Okay, how do you feel about taxes? You want to lower taxes, increase taxes. Okay. So, I think we're asking adult voters about taxes, we can do stratified sampling. So you divide the population into the distinct subgroup or strata, age, gender, income, and then sample from each stratum. So you you try to make sure that each important subgroup is represented in the sample. So we look at men, women, uh, people with different age groups, younger voted. Photos, medium age photos, older photos, people with different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. And try to sample getting a, a certain number of each person in, in each stratum. So the advantage is you get each cell group in the sample and you are able to 
look at group differences between older and older men, women, all that. You need prior knowledge of the subgroup. And it's more complex to implement than simple random sampling. But it may be better in the sense that you know you're capturing the, the subgroup. If you're only getting a few hundred people, that may be more important to you than trying to do a simple random sample, which you probably can't do anyway if you don't have the whole group. Cluster sampling is very similar. Involves dividing the population into clusters, based on geography, and then randomly and then randomly selecting entire clusters to be included in the sample. Okay. I don't really have much to do with much to say about cluster sampling. It it had its place, but I'm not gonna really harp on it. Okay, um systematic sampling. So in this you have a list of the entire population which is in my opinion, optimistic, unless you have a small population. So you can stand for every 10 individual in the list, and that's the example in here. So, in this setup, you don't have to stand for everyone. You only have to stand for every individual. And if the list is randomized, there's not much bias in this selection method. You you risk a, a problem with periodicity, in which case, like, it, if every 10 individual somehow is significant, like, it, let's say it's not randomized, it's alphabetical, or by address, then it, it may not be the best method to use. And it's not at random at simple random sampling. Okay. Now here is the the real big uh, kicker here. For lack of a less weird term. Convenient sampling is honestly what most people use. I hate to say it, but that's what we got going on here. A convenient sample, you, you just select people who are around you. If, with probably at people around your college, the people in the community around your college, undergraduate students. There's a joke that psychology needs the study of undergraduate students. And perhaps there's some truth in that joke. Because many, many psychological experiments look at undergraduate students. Even if the underlying thing they're worried about isn't undergraduate students, they're worried about people in general. They're worried about older people, less um, economically advantaged people. They're, they're worried about the human experience and slash psyche in general, but what they really get is undergraduate students. And especially because that undergraduate students are rewarded for participating in research. And perhaps they should be, they, they spend their time doing it. Where no one else has a, a real benefit other than financial incentives. They over have to need like a unique treatment. But I, I'm going off on a tangent, but much research today is based on convenience sampling. And as convenient as that is, it has its drawbacks in not really capturing the population of interest. Unless you nearly define your population of interest as being undergraduate students, or honestly, sometimes even more narrowly, psychology undergraduate students. So, huge selection bias. And the ability to centralize findings to an entire population of interest that's not narrowly defined is quite difficult. 
and that problem is often overlooked. The quota sampling is like a hybrid between stratified sampling and convenient sampling. Honestly, I don't really, I'm not that familiar with these sampling techniques, but honestly, we only, convenient sampling is really the only thing we practically ever do. And, and that's the same, because I've never worked on political polling, and I'm sure I would use more of these sampling techniques if I actually had to do my best to get at the political opinions of the population. So, the last big one is snowball sampling, and this one actually is relevant. But not relevant, but like an important one. The snowball sampling is when you have more difficult to reach populations. Let's say you're work, working with like a rare disease. Um, I, I don't know, a, hey, stable policy. That's not rare, but whatever. If you have trouble finding people with terrible policy, you will find a few people with terrible policy, and those people will recommend other people they know with terrible policy because of, you know, like communities of people who have disorders. Not, not natural, but like social communities. They, they, they seek each other out, know each other as a form of social support. So, snowball sampling, I feel like I went on a tangent, which is pretty much a description of my whole YouTube channel, uh, where you find a few individuals in hard to reach populations, and then have those individuals recommend other participants that might be interested in, in your study. So, the advantage is it can be easier to find people, and cost effective, but you're not actually either asking for an informal uh, recommendation. But there's a high degree of bias associated with that. If people do not have an equal likelihood of being selected, it's not people, you're going to get people that are similar to the other people you have in your study. Because they're acquaintances, they're friends, they know each other. And they might know each other quite well if you actually pull another person into your study based on a recommendation from that last person. Because I don't know that I would go into a study based on a recommendation from someone I was not a good friend of. So it's not a random sample, but when it's a hard to reach population, it actually might be the best you got with finite resources. Okay, so, yeah, these are some sampling techniques, and that's all I got. That's the end of the video. Thank you for watching.